Good morning. Good morning. The Lord be with you. As we gather this morning, I invite everyone to take a deep breath. And whatever stuff that you might have brought into the room, whatever it might be that might draw you away from the presence of God, I invite you in these next few moments simply to let that go. That we might be fully available, fully ready to experience everything God has for us. Let us prepare all that we are for the worship of God. Let us come to God in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks that you love us more than we could ever imagine or even dream. And as we gather this morning in this place, may you open us up to that truth, to the depth and completeness of your love for us, for everyone, for this entire world. And Lord, as we experience how deeply and completely you love us, may, Lord, in the power of that love, may we grow to love ourselves and all those whom you place around us more deeply and completely as well. That your love might heal us and save us, renew us and transform us. That your love, working through us and in the life of this world, might bring that same salvation that same renewal, that same transformation to a world full of brokenness and need. And so, dear God, we bring this all to you in the name of the one who showed us your love so profoundly. In Jesus' name we pray it. And everybody who agreed together said, Amen. I invite us to continue our worship this morning as we sing together, I'll worship the King, all glorious above. Worship the King, all glorious above.
Please be seated. Before the prayer for forgiveness, will you please remember to turn off your cell phones. The prayer for forgiveness is adapted from St. John Chrysostom. We are not worthy, Master and Lord, that you should come beneath the roofs of our souls. Yet since in your love towards all, you wish to dwell in us, in boldness we come. You command, open the gates, which you alone have made. And you will come in and enlighten our darkened reasoning. We believe that you will do this, for you did not send away the prostitute who came to you with tears, nor cast out the repenting tax collector, nor reject the thief who acknowledged your kingdom. But you counted all these as members of your band of friends. You are blessed forevermore. Thank you, Jesus. In your blessed name, we pray. Amen. You know, there's, the Christian story is in some ways quite simple. The story is that a lie has infected the world. And the lie is that God does not really love us. That God's love cannot be trusted. And so, because of that lie, we try to get love, we try to get validation, we try to get approval countless other places in our life, and it leads us to be anxious and fearful. It leads us to be defensive. It leads us to make all sorts of wrong choices that hurt ourselves, that hurt others, that hurt the world around us. And so each week we come here to acknowledge the fact that we have lost touch with the love, that we have lost touch with the one who loves us like nothing else. And we come here to acknowledge that we believe the lie, but then we come here to let God remind us of the truth. That for all those broken places and broken thoughts and broken actions, that God has forgiven us, but more than that, that God still loves us, that God loves each of us no matter what. It's what these warders of baptism proclaim, that God's love is there for us in every moment, even our darkest moments, that God loves each of us, that God loves this entire world no matter what. Amen? And that's such important news. It's important that we share it with one another. So I invite you to turn to someone to your right or to your left, behind you, before you, and simply say to them, God loves you no matter what. You can give a handshake, a hug, a high five, whatever works.
loves you no matter what. Oh my goodness, such good news that God loves each of us. God loves this entire world no matter what. Can I have a big amen? Amen. And now we said it. Can everybody, can we sing it together with a song you'll see on the screen? Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. It shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour. As we come, please be seated as we hear from Olu as he leads us into preparing for hearing the word of the Lord. Olu. Thank you, Olu. I'd like to invite uh, kids that are with us this morning. Come up, sisters. Come on up. Don't be shy. T's up here. Come on up. They're like, I don't know. I've never been here before. Who is this weird guy? He gave us a high five. I don't know. Here comes the first sister. All right. Oh, we have a winner. Woo! Yes, now that we thoroughly embarrassed you. All right. What's your name? Hey, Madeline. Madeline, this is Tristan. But everybody kind of calls him T. Uh, 
Sounds cool. I don't know. Right. So, hey, T, meet Madeline. And who's, who's your sister in the back? Morgan. Hey, Morgan. Can you wave us? All right, good. All right. Now, what we're going to talk about this morning is we're going to talk about the fact that God makes us feel just right. You know that story, uh, the Go to Lock story? You ever heard the Go to Lock story? Go to Locks and Three Bears. I'm going to tell it in, in, uh, in the sermon this morning, but you can listen for it. It's a great story about uh, this girl who wants to find out what's just right in her life. And we all look for things that make us feel just right. But you know what? What really makes us feel just right is the fact that every moment of every day, God loves us. You know that? God loves you every moment of every day. Just like your mom, right? Your mom may always like what you do, but she never stops loving you, right? Never stops loving you. Your dad, right, never stops loving you. That's pretty cool. That's why we talk about God like a parent, like a mom or a dad. Because God's even more loving than that. Whoa! Because your mom and dad are like super loving, but God's even more loving. That's like, it's mind blowing. So let's take a moment and remember, and actually, there's something we can do here that can remind you of that. We do this. You can take some water. You can take some water right here. And what you do is you put it in your head like this, and you make a cross. The cross, the cross is the sign of God's love. We have crosses all over the place. And so you do that, and it feels refreshing, doesn't it? Like, whew, just like God's love. So make a big circle, because God's love is like a circle. It has no beginning and no end. Let's take a moment. Dear God, thank you that you help us feel just right, even on the days we're not feeling just right at all, that we know that we are just right in you, that you love us so very much. And Lord, may Madeline know that, may T know that, may Morgan know that, and may every one of us here know that, this day and always. Amen. All right. There you go. Oh, T, I missed a high five. Lay it on me. All right. And with that, I'm going to invite Kathy to share some more news of the community. And listen up, uh, some of y'all, Morgan and Madeline and T, because I think the first thing she's going to be talking about is Waumba Pajama Movie Night. Oh, she's going to talk about worship first if you're a visitor. So uh, I want still our thunder. Go ahead. First, I was going to welcome everybody to the service. <laughs> If you find in your uh, visitors, you'll find in your pew rack uh, an information card if you will fill it out so we know you're here and you have visited with us. Um, for information about our activities, please visit our website at fpcoh.org. Um, you will be happy to meet you at the, on the patio for refreshments after the service. On July 19th, we're going to have the pajama party that Kennedy mentioned. Um, it'll be movie night with pajamas and blankets, if you want, in the chapel at 6.30 p.m. Kids can come and enjoy, uh, I think it's going to be, is it going to be the Dalmatians? Yeah, 101 Dalmatians. 101 Dalmatians. And it's a night for everyone. The parents are free. The kids are going to pay $5 a person. I think there'll be some snacks and... Uh, yeah, we're going to provide like a little pasta dinner for the kids and everybody else. And then uh, at, parents can come and they can go see the movie or they can hang out in the patio, which is right outside. The chapel doors are right here. Uh, and, and have little wine or beer, uh, some appetizers, some water if you want. Um, or as m my wife calls wine, mommy juice. Uh, you can have some of that. Um, but no, it's a chance for parents and families to kind of come and connect. And not just for families. EC's coming to come see the movie, and you come hang out, relax. And, um, and the kids come in their pajamas. And we'll have a little popcorn for there for them after their little pasta dinner. And uh, you can have some pasta, too. So, Worship service will continue as is through mid-August with the 830 service. And then the 10 o'clock Bible study and at 11 o'clock, the regular classical service in the sanctuary. I believe Wumbaland will begin again in the middle of August. Uh, more announcements and slides will continue in the postlude 
at the end of this service. Uh, please check the website and the newsletter for any other bulletin announcements. Thank you, Kathy. You know, ever since uh, an old member here, who, by the way, works at uh, Channel 10, WPLG, ever since he told me this, Steve Ellis, I've always found this to be true. Every story, every national story, Steve Ellis said, will always have a Florida connection. And this week, I found Ellis's words to be true again. But I so wish they were not true. I so wish that this story had never happened. Um, did you read about it? It began in New Jersey as a private jet landed from Paris. And in that private jet was a very, very rich man who had committed some horrible crimes. But the story really didn't begin there. It began here, or an hour north of here, in Palm Beach. And there, uh, this man used his great wealth to prey upon high school and middle school kids. And at the time, for reasons still unclear, he did not have much accountability for that. But now, hopefully, he will finally receive justice. But the question comes to me, why? This man had untold wealth. He owns not one, but two islands for Pete's sakes. He had rich and famous friend. He had the respect of renowned scientists whose research he funded. And yet he risked all of that to commit horrible crimes. Why? Strangely enough, the same impulse that drove him at its core is the same impulse that can drive someone else to compulsively come to worship, come to church every week, week after week. And this person um, serves in every possible way, not only in the church, but in the community. And as a result, they do a lot of good things. They have a positive impact in many people's lives. But how can it be that the same impulse can drive both these people? That on one hand, it drives someone to great evil. On the other hand, it drives someone to great good. Yet the same impulse drives them, enslaves them both. More crucially, how can you make sure that this same impulse doesn't drive you, doesn't enslave you. In these words, God will show you the way. And so let us listen and hear what God has to say. And as we do so, can we stand and give honor to God's word with the song you'll see behind me on the screen? O oh, word of God incarnate, O oh, wisdom from on high, O oh, truth unchanged, unchanging, O oh, light of our dark sky, we praise you for the radiance that from the hallowed page, a lantern to our foot steps shines on from age to We're continuing our journey uh, through Paul's letter to the church at Galatia. I invite you to remain standing as we hear this word. Paul is in the midst of telling the story of a, of a conflict he had with another leader of the church named Peter or Cephas, where Peter was compromising, was um, 
kind of twisting the message of the gospel, of the good news. And so we kind of take up this narration of this a little bit in the middle, beginning in verse 14. But when I, Paul, saw that they, Peter, and the other Jewish believers were not acting consistently with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter, to Cephas, before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, and yet we know that a person is justified. Hold on to that word. It's going to be important. Not by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And we have come to believe in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by doing the works of the law, because no one will be justified by the works of the law. But if in our effort to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. But if I build up again the very things that I once tore down, then I demonstrate that I am a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if justification comes to the law, then Christ died for nothing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Now how can the same desperate impulse drive people in two radically different directions? One, it drives to great evil, and the other, it drives to great good. More crucially, how do you make sure that the same desperate impulse is not driving you, is not enslaving you? In these words, God tells you. God tells you how you become free from this desire. You become free from this desire. It does not come from what you do. It comes from what you know. And when you know this crucial truth about yourself, then that is what frees you. And, and the key to understanding this crucial truth is to understand a, a somewhat unusual word that Paul uses here again and again called justification. But to understand that word, you first need to understand another word to which justification points. And that word is righteousness. What makes someone a Christian? Is it loving your neighbor? Is it caring for the poor? Is it being kind hearted and gracious? Now, certainly, those things should characterize someone who calls themselves a Christian. But is that what makes you a Christian? Think about it this way. Say you are a surgeon, and someone comes to you and says, what makes you a surgeon? And you say, well, surgeons wear green shirts. Now, you would be right. Surgeons, you know, they wear those green medical, medical stuff, right? But is that what makes you a surgeon? Does, does that get to the core of being a surgeon? I mean, lots of people wear green shirts, right? And it's the same way with Christianity. I mean, after all, lots of people who are not Christians love their neighbors. Lots of people who are not Christians care for the poor. Lots of people who are not Christians are kind-hearted and gracious. In fact, some of them, to be honest, are more kind-hearted and gracious than some Christians. So what is it that makes a Christian a Christian? A Christian knows, Christians know, that they are right. Now, before you react to that, let me unpack it. I'm not talking about right as in factually correct right. I'm not even talking right as in doing right things. I am talking about right as in just right, as in Cody Locks. Do you remember the story of Goldilocks, right? Goldilocks 
goes to the house of the three bears, and she goes in, right? She tries the porridge. One is too hot. One is too cold. But then there is one that is what? Just right. Oh, yeah. And then she goes and to the living room, and she sits in one chair, and it's too big. And she sits in another chair, and it's too big. And then she sits in another chair, and of course it is what? Just right. Until she breaks it, if you know the story. And then she goes into the beds, and one bed is too hard, one bed is too soft, but the final bed is what? Just right. That's right. And she falls asleep there. We all know what just right means, right? We all kind of get a sense in our gut of what just right means. And that's because human beings spend their entire lives searching for what is just right. I don't know about you, but even when I hear that term, just right, it kind of gives a nice feeling. (sighs) Something's just right. And the reason that human beings search for something that is just right is they have a deep sense within that something in them is not just right. And so they spend their entire life searching for that. And to understand this just right, we need to understand what the Bible means by righteousness. You see, what the Bible means by righteousness is not that you do right things. What the Bible means by righteousness is that you are in right relationship with everything. God, people, the world, yourself. But the problem is, is that human beings are never really in right relationship with anything. I mean, look at the Goldilocks story. What happens, right? The three bears come home, and they are angry. (laughs) Someone's been eating their their food. They go in to the living room, and someone's busted up one of their chairs. And then they go into their bedrooms, and there's somebody sleeping in one of their beds. And then Goldilocks wakes up. She freaks out at the bears. She runs screaming out of the home, and she never returns to the bear's house again. How about that for a happy ending? It may not be a happy ending, but it is a profoundly true ending. The story you could summarize this way. Human being searches for what is just right and ends up messing her life up and all the lives of those around her. Now, why is it that human beings in this desperate search mess up everything. It has to do with the fact that there is one core reality, one core relationship that lies at the root of all messed up relationships. That they have lost a right relationship with God. See, human beings have come to believe that God does not really love them. That they cannot trust God's love for them. And yet they yearn to feel that love. They yearn to feel worthy and valued and loved like that. They yearn to know that God loves them unconditionally, that God loves them without end. They yearn to know that God looks at them and smiles. And so, even as they desperately crave to know that love, to know that assurance, they don't believe it. So they look for it in all the wrong places. Why did Epstein do those awful things? He did it for the same reason he amassed huge wealth in Lots of rich and famous friends. He did it so he could feel just right. And in the twisted 
spaces of his mind, he did not care who he exploited, who he exploited, or who he damaged in order to get what he needed. But you do not have to do horrible things to have the same desperate desire be driving you. I mean, after all, Paul admits here that the same desperate desire drove him. In this case, it did not lead him to evil acts. It led him to religion. And he said the only thing that freed him was dying to this religion. As he puts it, he died to the law that he might live in Christ. And he said that alone is what liberated him. That alone is what freed him. And how did Paul become free? Paul became free through something called justification. This past week, when I got home on a Wednesday, my son Patrick admitted to me that he had eaten a cupcake that day. And you need to understand in our family, we have a very strict treat policy. We have Candy Friday, and only on Friday can you have a treat. And this was a Wednesday. So Patrick knew he had broken treat rule of our house. But then he went on to explain. He said, Dad, I was at summer camp, and they had a cupcake craft activity. We were making a cookie monster cupcake, and I placed the cookie and the edible eyes right on top of the cupcake. And then he said, I only ate part of it. You know, just enough to fulfill the activity. It was a sacrifice. <laughs> now, now what, was, what was Patrick doing? He was justifying himself, Right? See, that's what justification does. It does not change the facts. He still ate a cupcake on Wednesday and not Friday. But it does change the perspective. It changes how you view it. See, that's what justification does. It doesn't change the facts. But it does change the view. And Paul had discovered that God had justified him. He didn't need to justify himself. God had done that for him. See, what this means is that God doesn't erase all the things in your life that you've done wrong. God does not erase the brokenness of your life. But God in Jesus does change how all of that is viewed. He changes the viewpoint. See, in Jesus, that is what God did. God changed the view. And that, once you know it, liberates you. Because in Jesus... God shows you that in spite of everything, God still sees you with eyes of love. That God has never stopped seeing you with eyes of love. Because Jesus shows us that because in our desperate and misdirected drive to feel just right, we ended up in Jesus killing God. Yet even on that cross, God still looked at us with eyes of love. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do, Jesus said. Even death did not stop God loving us. God's love even conquered death. And when you know that love, when you know that this love has given up everything for you, that this love has seen you at your worst, and still loves you, that frees you. You become free. 
because you know that God sees all of you, even in your ugliest places, yet because of Jesus, because of that shift in viewpoint that Jesus shows us, God chooses to view you at the core as beautiful, as approved, as just right. Because that's how God loves you. God loves you like that. God loves you, no matter what. And all you need to do is believe it. That's why it's called justification by faith. Justification by belief. But when you know that, then you know. You know that you are just right, even when you are not so right. You don't have to go looking for just right. You don't have to be trying to get it in all the places it doesn't even exist. And even when you are not feeling just like just right, even when your life is so far from just right, then you still know, you know within, deep within, that you are just right always and forever. And this knowledge, this sense of rightness that God gives you deep within, that frees you as nothing else can. Do you know that? Do you know that you are already just right? All you got to do is believe it. That changes everything. If you don't believe it, then maybe today will be the day that you do. Let us pray. Dear God, um, we give you thanks that you love us, that you loved us so much that you came and became one of us, and you became our friend, a friend of sinners, as the term goes. And out of your great love, you gave everything, your life for us. As Paul puts it, you loved us, loved us and gave yourself for us. And so, Lord, you did that so that our view might change, that we might trust your love once again, we might stop believing the lie and knowing that we are approved and validated and valued. We would stop looking for value and approval and validation in all the wrong places through ways that often are destructive that cause us to have broken relationships with our world, with each other, even with ourselves. But Lord, once we know that you love us, then all those relationships begin to be healed so that, Lord, even how we relate to ourselves changes, how we relate to others changes. How we relate to the world changes. May we know that this morning, Lord. And if you're here this morning, and you've known that, but you've kind of forgotten it, I invite you in these moments, simply remember it once again, to know that you are loved, that you are justified, that you are just right in God's eyes. And if you've never believed it, never known that to be the message, maybe even come to church and never known that is the message, then maybe today just say, God, I want to believe this. Help me believe that you love me like that. 
that I am just right in your eyes. Whatever it is you need to say to God, whatever it is that God may be wanting to say to you, I invite you to take a few moments in the silence, simply to talk or simply to be quiet, and I invite you to do that now. Dear God, thank you for your love. Your love that has made us just right. As strange as that may sound, it is beautifully true. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. I invite us to stand together as Kathy leads us in what it is that we believe. And I myself no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the real life I now have within this body is a result of my trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Please remain standing as we sing, Be Thou My Vision. Please be seated. As we come to prayer, let us come once again in song. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks that you do love us. That it is your love that gives us value not because of anything we have done, but simply because we are. That we are your children, and all we need to do is embrace that truth. And dear God, we give you thanks that you show us that truth and the beauty of the world around us and the sun that rises each day and relationships that you give us parents and children, 
sisters and brothers, friends and colleagues. Almighty, gracious God, we give you thanks that you show us that most profoundly in Jesus. That in you, you came to live among us, to become one of us. And dear God, you suffered everything that we suffer, and you became our friend. And you ate with us and shared us your wisdom and healed our sickness and cast out evil from among us, from within us. And out of your great love, you gave everything, even your life, so that we might know the truth, so that truth might live in us, so that you might live in us, and that we might know that we are just right in your sight, and nothing can change that ever. Trusting, Lord, in this love, we bring to you a world that is still full of such brokenness and pain. We pray, Lord, for a nation that is divided over so many issues. We pray, Lord, for the suffering at the border. And we pray that, Lord, relief might come and might come soon. And that you will give wisdom and guidance to all our leaders and the president on down as they deal with those difficult issues and so many others in the life of our nation and world. And Lord, we pray for this world that is full of such brokenness and pain. Lord, we remember with gratitude that in spite of the na issues in our nation, we have freedoms that other nations and other peoples can only dream of. And we pray, Lord, for those folks who do not have the freedom to speak or to pray, or to worship, who live in fear of their own governments. We pray that for China and North Korea. We pray it, Lord, for the people of Venezuela. We pray it for the people of Hong Kong. We pray, too, Lord, for those who do not know peace, who suffer under war and bloodshed and injustice and evil. And Lord, we pray, Lord, for peace to come with justice to Syria, to Iraq, to Afghanistan, to Yemen, to every place of suffering and brokenness in our world, to the violence in Central America that has sent so many fleeing to our borders. We pray too, Lord, for the folks besieged even now by a storm in Louisiana, in Texas, soon Arkansas and Florida. We pray that, Lord, you give them relief, that you protect them. And almighty and gracious God, we pray, Lord, for our neighbors, Lord, who do not have peace within, who are lost in despair or discouragement, who are looking for just right in all the wrong places. And we pray, that, Lord, you will show them your love. We pray for those struggling with physical needs, those struggling with health issues, struggling with grief, those struggling to find work or struggling to keep a roof above their heads or have already lost it. We pray that you will meet and address each and every one of these needs and that you will enable us to be a church that reaches out in love to everyone. Through our learning center ministries and the summer camps going on now, through pajama movie night this Friday, through the work of Share Meal that finished last weekend, to the work in Haiti that we do with the orphans there, with Temple Bethel. We pray for those preparing to leave on that trip in a couple weeks. And almighty and gracious God, we pray for those people too that in particular you have laid upon our hearts. And this morning, even as I open those prayers up, I cannot help but be reminded by those who have been victimized, by people such as Epstein and others. Lord, there are so many. I pray for healing for them and protection. And then today will come, Lord, where such evil stops. 
And as I pray this, Lord, I invite you to open up for whatever names or concerns or people that God has laid upon your hearts. You can lift them up out loud or in the quietness of your hearts. And I invite you to do that now. Dear God, we bring each of these things to you. And as we do, remember the prayer that you shared with us. And as your beloved children, we pray these words together boldly. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In gratitude for all that God has done for us, let us offer our tithes and gifts to God. Please stand. Lord, we cannot, cannot fathom, fathom or hold you. We can only ask you to take hold of us. We cannot grasp or contain you in a formula or tradition. We can only ask you to fill us with yourself and make us part of the mystery of your presence in the world. In your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing Live Into Hope. Live into all. 
of captives freed, of sight regain me in of greed. The oppressed shall be the first to see the year. Do you know you are just right? And if you know that, you kind of feel it, that you are just right. Even on the days when things are not just right. Even in the days that you don't feel at all just right. You can know you are just right. Because God has made you that. In Jesus, God offered up God's very life to show you that. So you don't have to look for it anywhere else. You don't have to look for it in approval of others. You don't have to look for it in religious ritual. You don't have to look for it in all the places that we all do look for it. But you can know that you are loved. And that God looks at you every moment of every day and smiles. May the knowledge of that love go with you. The God who loved you first. The God who in Jesus offered up everything for you. And the God who has freed you to know that you are loved even in your most broken of places. And may the love of this God go with you. May it heal you. May it restore you. May it save you. And may it bless you. Amen. God be with you till we meet again. Loving counsels guide and uphold you with the shepherd's care in full.